Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part three in the Compact Desk Pro video series. If you haven't seen part one and two yet, I recommend you go watch those first because it's relevant to the part three. So like the other videos in this series, this one's rather long and there's gonna be a lot covered in it. I've tried to break it up into sections to make it a little easier to navigate. And to help that, I'm gonna put links down in the description below that will allow you to basically jump to any of the sections very quickly and easily. So if you're watching a section that you're not really interested in, you can click down in the description and go directly to one other section that maybe you are interested in. Just so I can let you guys know up front, in part three, things we're gonna be working on are fixing that 401 error that I get a boot on this machine by editing the BIOS and looking at disassembled BIOS code, taking a brief look at the modem that's inside this machine, very brief, I might add, reading the Compact Desk Pro service manual so I can rearrange the drives into the correct orientation. Then I'm gonna be taking a look inside the monitor and then also using the oscilloscope to check the signals coming out of the video card on this machine. And finally, we're gonna look at some viewer submitted programs that take full control of the CPU speed of this machine and the key click so I don't have to use those debug scripts and also some new software to run the clock chip that's in this thing. All right, let's get right to it. First up, let's address the 401 error I'm getting when booting this machine. In the previous video, there were all sorts of theories as to what the problem was, and everyone thought it was the LPT1 port conflict or something like that. Well, thanks to viewer Jim Leonard, and there's a thread of comments on my part two video, he took a ROM dump that I created and he disassembled the ROMs and actually took a look at the assembly code to find out what it's doing exactly. But looking here at the disassembled code that he has done, it seems like what's happening is that the computer on PowerUp is trying to test the LPT port, and it's looking for an LPT port at address 3BCH, which on my machine doesn't even exist. There is just nothing on that port. It starts testing and it calls the subroutine probe port. We jump down to probe port. This does some testing through this loop here. And what happens is, is if successful the test, it you know returns normally back to the other subroutine. But if it doesn't, it gets down to ports val differ. And what happens is it jumps to what is in the BX register on the processor. Here we are back at the, the original test routine where this all started. And the BX register in the CPU gets set to basically the offset of this subroutine right here, which is the post error code. So down in the probing part, when the values weren't matching, it would actually jump to this subroutine right here and look at what it's doing. It's moving 401 into register DX and then it calls the routine output post error. And this is where it is now printing 401 to the screen, creating a beep and then continuing to boot. So in the end, what's happening here is the BIOS is expecting to find a parallel port at 3BC. It doesn't matter that I have one in the computer at a different address. It doesn't even bother checking that. It's only checking 3BC. And when that fails, because of course there's nothing there, it prints error 401. And it will do that even if I don't have a parallel port at all in the machine. So this has nothing to do with the conflict, but it is to do with the parallel port. So I have very limited knowledge about the way the BIOS works on a PC, but I think I have enough information here that I can fix this so that I can avoid that 401 error code, but we still have a working parallel port on address 378. I wanna hex edit the BIOS to change these two addresses right here and right here from 3BC to 378 hex. And then when it runs the test routine, it should actually test against the parallel port that I actually have installed in this computer. Here's a list of the hexadecimal IO ports that parallel ports live at. 3BC, which was only used on the very earliest PCs, and I guess these compacts, and then the normal LPT1 of 378, which is basically 286s and on use this, and then 278 was for LPT2. So I think all I'm really gonna need to do is just alter the addresses in the test routines here, just so it checks the correct LPT1 port. Okay, so now to hex edit. Here's the hex editor. I have a copy of the ROM open. And what we need to do is find the portion of the code where this address is held. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna search for something that's adjacent to it, 
like this right here. We'll go find and we put that in there and we're going to jump to it. And then we're just going to go back and forth and check that essentially what we're looking for is these three bytes I just searched for. Now we're going to look for B, A, B, C, O, 3, E, C. And that's what we should see coming up. So there are the three bytes. And then we have B, A right there, B, C, O, 3, E, C. So I'm pretty confident that this is the correct section right here. And this is the address right there, O, 3, B, C. And I need to change this from O, 3, B, C to O, 3, 7, 8. So O, 3, I'm just going to leave it alone. And then B, C, this is going to change to seven, eight. And we have to jump down to the next test code here, which also is hard coded with three BC. So actually, if we just keep going, we will actually run into it. So let's look for E865 FC, E865 FC, BA, which is right there, BC03 EE FC. Okay, so that's definitely the code right there. This is it right here. So there's the BC, which we also need to change to seven, eight. And now those two bytes are changed, which has the equivalent of changing this instruction right here to 378 hex and the same up here, 378 hex, which means when it runs the diagnostics, it should absolutely work. We're not quite done yet. A BIOS ROM has a one byte checksum at the end of the ROM. And if you don't correct that, it's not gonna work. We're going to use hex workshop here to calculate that checksum. I have the original compact ROM open right now. At the end, the last byte is CC, and that is the checksum byte we have to calculate. Let's open up the modified ROM. And if we look at the bottom, of course, it's still going to say CC, but that's no longer correct because I've altered it. So first we select the entire ROM, except for the last byte, and we generate checksum, and we generate an 8-bit checksum. And down there, you'll see that the checksum is now AC. So to calculate the new checksum, we're gonna to need to use the Windows calculator and we're gonna set it into programmer mode under hexadecimal. And we're gonna take 100 and we're gonna subtract the checksum result, which is AC. And that gave us 54, which we type into the ROM. And that's the new checksum. So the EEPROM inside the compact has a sticker over it, and I don't really want to peel off that original sticker, but since it was an 8K ROM, I'm assuming the EEPROM is a 2764, and I happen to have a bunch of those. Here's some 2764 EEPROMs, and I have my trusty old Mini Pro EEPROM programmer. I'll just connect this up to the USB connection, drop the chip on there. So in the Mini Pro software, we're just gonna change it to a 27C64. And then let's open the patched ROM up. I know this is my edited file because it's got 2019 in the date here. This is helpful so when I put this into the compact, I can just check the beginning of the BIOS ROM and see if the date has changed. That way I know this ROM is working properly. We're going to program the chip. I'm going to hit program on the Mini Pro software. The program like becomes solid while it's programming. There it is. It's weird, it's not even initializing the monitor at all. I can just hear it's not sounding right. So I just pulled it out of the motherboard and one chip was bent out. That would keep it from working. So I straightened the pin out and I just need to reinstall it into the motherboard. Now that's in without any bent pins. Flashing cursor. All right, 401601, that's normal. The floppy card is not installed. So it's working, interesting. I'm gonna pop the card back in. So now with the floppy card installed, let's turn this back on. So theoretically now it should check the LPT port on 378 hex, which is where it actually is, and we won't see a 401 error. Look at that. <laughs> oh, no more 401 error. It does say no slot clock not found because I don't have the no slot clock in anymore under the EEPROM. Next, let's go into debug and use DFE00 colon zero, and that will show the BIOS code and hopefully we'll see our new 2019 date. And yes, there it is, 2019. Double thumbs up. So this is the modified ROM. I'm gonna stick it into the no slot clock again, carefully. Okay, it looks good. And I'll just stick a little piece of tape over the window here. And I just write with a marker to say what this is, desk pro. And we'll put fixed, like that. 
And the original EEPROM, I am just going to stick on a little piece of anti-static foam, cut this down to size. I'm going to put this into a little anti-static bag and keep it inside the computer so it doesn't get misplaced. And there we are, it's all back in the machine with the no-slot clock. Now a little cosmetic work. So there's something else I'm going to change up on this. So one of my viewers sent me a link to the Compact Desk Pro 386 technical manual. It's not very useful, it doesn't have a lot of useful information in it, but I think some of this stuff is applicable to this machine, and this specific thing caught my eye. It shows that the A drive is on the top left and the B drive is on the top right, with the hard drive being underneath the B, and then the tape drive, if you have one, is underneath the A drive. And obviously on my machine, A and B are on top of each other and the hard drive is over in the C position. So I wanna rearrange this so it matches this particular diagram. I know this is like a minor detail, but I just wanna make this machine look more like it did when it was new. And all the drives are on rails in this, and luckily all four drive bays have the rails. So all I need to do is take some screws off the sides and I can rearrange this stuff. Et voila. Floppy drive A, floppy drive B, hard drive C, and a blank in that D spot, just as Compaq envisioned it. Now, a quick clean of the keyboard using some Windex. The keyboard was quite dirty when I got it, but I just gave it a little bit of a clean, and I mean, very minor. I didn't even take the keys off. I just wiped a lot of the dirt off, and now it looks a lot nicer, and it's not so filthy looking. Next, let's take a very quick look at the modem that came with this machine. Here's the modem card. It's made by Ventel which it says on the back here, Ventel, but I have no idea what speed this modem is. It actually doesn't say anything anywhere on here. I can tell it has an 8250 UART, which these aren't that good. They're not buffered, so it's not great. So this is probably something like a 2400 bits per second modem. It's hard to tell. It's time to take a closer look at the compact dual mode amber monitor. So several people have asked and I've promised to open this monitor up so we can take a closer look inside to see what type of picture tube it has and what's going on in there. Plus it's probably a good idea for me to check to see if anything looks suspect or about to explode like capacitors and things. The back of the yellowed monitor has just two screws on the top half and two screws on the bottom half. So I will just pop these off. Ooh, you really see the non-yellowed plastic underneath there. There you go. Inside the plastic has the metallicized paint, sort of a shielding, plus a metal shield. This is where the grate is, so it keeps stuff from accidentally falling inside the monitor. Don't know who made this monitor for Compaq, but it does say Borg Warner right there. If any of this gives you any clues, uh, put them in the comments. I'd love to hear what you think. Wow, it looks pretty good in here, actually, considering the amount of hours this thing probably had on it to get all that burn in. One thing that's for sure is here's the non-yellowed plastic, and yes, it's creamy color, but it's certainly uh, way lighter than anything on the outside of the computer. So there's a sticker on the shield on the neck PCB here, and it says Zenith Electronic Corp. Model number 12CQM31. 13 volts DC, 2 amps. So on the yoke it says MTI Monotronics Taiwan, 8705, 5th week of 1987. I don't see anything particularly bad looking on the board, although this one electrolytic here, the leg seems a little corroded looking. It's nice that they're sideways, so any leakage isn't gonna go straight onto the PCB. It'll sort of drip down, but there are some larger caps down there, and those seem fine. I don't see any kind of bulging going on. Typical fashion, this is sort of turned sticky. There's a sticker here in German, so I can't really read what it says, but it talks about unter 20 kilovolts. So <laughs> obviously something to do with that. And there's a sticker up here in English that's talking about the DAG ground must be uh, remain intact when installing in the terminal. But in a corner, this thing here is acting like the ground, and those wires are kind of one heads off to the neck board and one heads off to the PCB here. What's kind of bumming me out is usually there's a sticker on the CRT itself showing the manufacturer and also the type of phosphor used and the size, kind of a, a code you can look up. There's nothing. This thing doesn't have it. It has these two stickers, and that's it. And there's a little sticker here that says Run 7064, and then there's two stickers up at the top. And, you know, I really can't read this, just sort of some hand-scratched writings on there. But there are no other main stickers on the CRT anywhere, on either side or on the bottom. So there's one more sticker on the inside of the chassis. Sorry, it's a little shaky. I have to hold the camera. All this really reveals is the date there, February 12th, 1987. 
And it does say that this monitor runs at 13 kilovolts. So remember I mentioned that this amber color when the monitor is off is a little unusual and I wanted to see if there's actually a white phosphor just behind an amber coating. I'm going to end up putting a bright picture into the CRT and then we're going to turn off the lights and we're going to look through this edge right here of the picture. And you can often just see some phosphor glow through there. I want to see what color it is. Yeah, so nothing too revealing. Up in the top here, it definitely looks like I can see some orange phosphor. But one thing is interesting is you can see right here, there's actually quite a bit of the CRT that is behind the bezel. So the bezel on the front of the monitor blocks out, I'd say at least centimeter or a centimeter and a half of the CRT on both sides. Compact probably did that because as you get closer to the edge of the CRT, you lose sharpness. So to maintain as much sharpness as possible, they seem to have truncated quite a bit of the CRT on all sides. Same thing on the top. There's quite a bit of the CRT that's actually hidden behind the bezel. But you're kind of getting an idea of the color of the phosphor through this little edge right there. I'm going to say that the phosphor itself is amber, but the glass also has an amber tint to it for whatever reason. So I've been very curious to know how this monitor is getting the 16 shades of gray, because normally a CGA output allows that, but it's a digital signal and it's not something that easily converts into analog like this. We require some extra circuitry. People have theorized that it's pin seven on the connector, which isn't normally used, is carrying an analog type video signal that doesn't have the sync signal, but just has the intensities. All right, so I've probed the pins and everything looks like very standard CGA. We got one and two is ground, three, four, five is RGB, six is the intensity, and this is pin seven, which is reserved normally, not really used. And we're definitely getting some kind of signal. I switched it to AC coupling. I wouldn't, I don't know if this is exactly what I would expect to see though, because I had a color ramp going on. And yeah, this is not exactly what I expected to see on here. I wouldn't really call this a normal analog video signal. Doesn't quite look like it. It's also very slow. We're getting some flashing going in there. So it definitely seems like a video signal. If you have thoughts about what might be going on, I'd love to hear it. But right now I'm at a loss. This is a strange looking signal to me. Not at all what I thought it would be. Let's revisit the CPU speed control utility made by a viewer. One of my viewers, friendly neighborhood Jesus Freak, came up with the utility that allowed me to control CPU speed from the command line without having to use the debug command. But the utility didn't quite work. It wasn't parsing the arguments properly. So he came back with an augmented version. And this time he actually allows you to control the speed slow or fast or do a query, but you can also use dash C to set the keyboard click. So really this one command now replaces all of those scripts I had and it's much more convenient. So let's just give this a quick test. It's really nice to not see the 401 errors anymore since modifying the BIOS. It's CPT util dash Q that shows me the current CPU speed. I change this to dash S I do Q. And sure enough, the red light is on on the front of the machine, which means that it's running in slow speed. And now it says fast here and the light is green on the front of the computer. And let's type dash C and we'll put seven for key click seven. That's pretty clicky. It's about as, it's kind of a, creates a little short beep actually. And we'll put this to zero and that's it. No more click. So that absolutely works. You can put anything in between here Neat. Now check the description. I put a link to his utility so you don't have to go find this particular comment. You can download that utility yourself if you have one of these compacts. It's a good chance that this probably works on other similar models of Desk Pro and possibly the portables as well, like the Portable 2 and the 286. Those probably have different CPU speeds that are probably controlled in a very similar way. So let's talk about the clock in here. Remember, it's the no slot clock and I was using the XT clock utility. That's the one that allows us to read the clock. And then there's the clock in it. That's the one that writes the time to the clock. But then one of my viewers said that this program SMW clock also would work with this particular clock chip that's in the no slot clock. So I've copied onto this computer. Let's just see what happens when we run it. Well, and sure enough, it, it found a clock and that's the correct address because FE00 is the BIOS address and that's where the clock is under. But look at the time, 1939, 17th of December. So it could have been the way the XT clock program, the clock chip is slightly different than the way this program except, expects it to be. So if we run this, so there's the date and time, but the date's actually several days off now. I think it's the 22nd of December. So while the time is set, the battery must be running low in that clock. 
and it's just not incrementing the timer anymore properly, and the time is also quite far off. So this clock is finding the same 17th of December. The year is wrong. The time is correct. That's what's also stored in the clock. Let's check out the README for the smartwatch clock utility. It says that the clock chip itself is good for 2149, but MS-DOS only will work up to 2099. Wow, what are we gonna do in that many years when we can't use our clock anymore? So the first command I was running just displays the time in the chip. You see that copy the time from DOS into the chip and S to set, take the time from the chip and set DOS. So I'm gonna set the date in DOS correctly. I'm gonna use the smartwatch command with a C that should copy the DOS date, which is the 23rd, into the clock chip. And there it is. Now if we just run the command without any parameters. So there, it's showing the right time now. So I guess it's just the way that XT clock set the date in a different way that just wasn't compatible with this program. Now what I like about this utility is it won't blank the screen out while it's setting the time like the XT clock one does. And there I'm adding the smartwatch clock S command to my auto exec bat. Let's reboot the computer and see if the time sticks. There it is, 23rd of December. So that's working, date. Awesome. To whoever suggested the smartwatch clock utility to test with the DOSOT clock, thank you very much. I apologize for not printing out the comment, so I can't thank you by name, but the utility does work perfectly on this particular smartwatch. Now, if anyone knows how I can kind of dremel this open and add a new battery into here, or cut through the connections and maybe stick an external battery, then I would love to hear, because obviously this thing is no longer keeping time correctly, and that'll be due to the fact that the batteries in there are completely drained. Well, that's it for part three in the compact video series. We are nearly there on this machine. It's taken a lot longer than I thought it would, but it's been an interesting journey. I really want to say thank you to all the viewers who put wonderful suggestions and comments down in the comment section, including those disassembling my ROM to help me fix the 401 problem, and writing utilities to control the speed and keyboard click of a machine from 1984? That's just amazing. In part four, I will show you finally how I got the MFM hard drive working. And as you probably realized already, this is shot out of order because the hard drive is already in this machine and it's working. So that's a little bit of a spoiler there. But I'll go through all the steps it took me to get from a bad hard drive that barely worked to one that is now working fine and running this machine fully. I hope everyone's been enjoying this series so far. If you have, I would love a thumbs up. But you know, if you didn't like this video or any other ones, you know what to do, hit me a thumbs down. Of course, there'll be more videos, so hit that subscribe button. Hit that little bell if you wanna be notified of when I post new ones. Definitely put more comments and suggestions down in the comment section below. I definitely read all of them. And thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.